All right, um, let's try and keep it on schedule, which is always difficult, especially at the end of the day. Um, I think I'm speaking on behalf of everyone that we've been having thus far a tremendous conference. Um, and quality of the talks is immense, and we have such good quality. Um, and to crown a perfect day with a perfect talk, it's, it's my utmost pleasure um, to have um, my good friend and colleague and, um, and my former boss, um, Martin Fisher here. And just to give you a little information about where he comes from, I wrote it down. Um, Martin completed his PhD at University of Massachusetts with Keith Rayner. Then he moved on um, to do his postdoctoral research appointment at Munich and finally uh, took up his permanent position uh, at University of Dundee, where we eventually met, um, where I was his postdoc. And then Martin, unfortunately, for Dundee, unfortunately, um, uh, left that uh, nice little town in Scotland and moved to his motherland, to Germany, where he is now chair and professor um, of cognitive science in University of Potsdam. So with no further ado, Martin Fisher. This is a recorder here. Um, where's the laser pointer? There's none? Okay, in that case, it cannot be the perfect talk. If I don't have a laser pointer, I have to stand here. <laughs> yes, but I, I like to walk around and then, you know, point from the left and right. I will try. Well, does anyone have a laser pointer that they can lend me? That's a recorder, I think. Okay, nevertheless, I'll do my best <laughs> to, yeah, is it? Okay, so with this, yes, perfect. Oh, much better. So, now I'm free. <laughs> Speaking of embodied cognition, yeah, I have to move. Okay, so it'll be also because I want everyone to see our nice logo here, people in the back, the Peacock logo, of Potsdam Embodied Cognition Group. This is where I'm from now. And I'll be talking about embodied representation of number knowledge. And here's the plan. So I hope to initially convince you that even the domain of number knowledge, which traditionally is thought of as being a prototypical example of abstract symbol manipulation kind of thinking. Even in the domain of number knowledge, we have clear signatures of embodiment. So I'll give examples from the sensory biases and motor biases induced by number processing. And these are the hallmarks of embodied concepts. Then, in the second part of the talk, I want to um, introduce a hierarchy of representations. And I will use the words grounding, embodiment, and situatedness which all occur in the literature very haphazardlessly, so arbitrarily, and I want to define them in a way that I think is very useful because it lends itself um, to interesting predictions. And I will um, show you some tests that we've conducted in the past, and uh, those of you who have already heard the first part, don't worry, there is new stuff. So the Potsdam Embodied Cognition Group has been very active, and there's some recent research which I would want to introduce and maybe we can discuss. So these are the implications. And all of this is hopefully not taking a, a whole hour, because I know you're all tired and your brains are full. Okay, as you know, there's nothing more practical than a good theory. Who, who said that? It's not Lenin or Marx or, it is who? <laughs> who said it? No. Kurt, Kurt Levin, who was a Gestalt psychologist. Nothing more practical than a good theory. So I'll start with a good theory that was very practical, but unfortunately wrong. And here's a picture of this theory, a summary of what people thought for a long time is a good way of characterizing our um, knowledge representations. And this um, 
this picture shows you several features of this knowledge representation. For example, you can see it's very systematic, it's hierarchical, and according to this view, all our knowledge can be nicely put into categories. So there are categories for different animals, and then the, the attributes of these animals are represented at the highest um, node, and all the members of the category would then inherit those different features. This is very nice to, um, to simulate, and it also happened to predict sentence verification times. You know, if you have to um, confirm or evaluate whether the statement is true, a bird has wings, you'll be able to say yes faster than if I show you the statement, a canary has wings, and that's presumably because these um, knowledge representations are represented differently. So for the um, second example, in order to verify it, you have to travel along this tree, mm -hmm. and that takes some extra time, which um, is reflected in the sentence verification latencies. So there were a lot of um, ideas in support of this kind of view. Mm -hmm. It also uh, fit well with the traditional um, um, Aristotelian views of how we think, but it encounters several problems. Some of them you probably learned about um, the prototypicality effects, that there is a graded category membership. That's not so big a deal because you can deal with this. Um, more profound is the grounding problem, which is shown here. So the grounding problem refers to the fact that if you believe knowledge is represented in these kind of hierarchical tree structures, then you're basically um, stating that your um, knowledge retrieval is a trip along that tree. So you're basically traveling from branch to branch, and this is an arbitrary path which would be the same for any kind of knowledge retrieval. So what I'm trying to say is that these kind of retrieval operations never are imbued with anything substantial. They are just activation patterns being passed forward and around in these, in these networks, but they don't make contact with the outside world. There's no, no meaning in this kind of activation pattern. So in order to, um, to really convey meaning, Somewhere there has to be a contact with experience and with um, the actual meaning of a concept such as um, force. And this is where the embodied cognition um, proposal starts and tries to, um, tries to take over the world, I could say. <laughs> um, so what I'm doing here is I'm only showing you this one slide, which is trying to summarize some which is trying to summarize a lot of research, and I'm just distilling it down to some very essential points because of time limitations. So the key, con the key idea behind embodied cognition is that all our knowledge remains associated with sensory and motor activation that was present when we acquired that knowledge. That's why all our concepts have sensory and motor associations, and they are preserved throughout life. An example is uh, shown in this cartoon here. Um, so the picture was taken from a very influential publication by Friedemann Pulvermüller, who proposed that uh, we represent knowledge in a distributed network, which um, includes, importantly, also motor areas. So the uh, concept like to kick would involve, among other brain areas, also a particular part of the motor cortex, namely that part that is in charge of making the leg move. And so the, the reason why that is so is because of a very well-known mechanism of learning, Hebbian association learning. When children acquire such concepts like kicking or licking or picking, they will be um, learning these words from a caregiver who is there and says, oh good, you kicked the ball. So there is sensory and motor activation co-occurring when the, when the child learns a new concept. And that is being laid down in these kind of distributed patterns. This picture is important because we will come back to it when I come to our recent research on numbers. So if that's, if that's true, all our concepts have sensory and motor associations, how can that be true for numbers? What are the um, sensory and motor associations for numbers? In order to... Um, to document this, I need to introduce to you a very influential study that has now been cited over 700 times already since it was published. De Haan et al. 1993 published a study on um, systematic associations 
between numbers and space. How many of you already know this study? Just a quick check. Okay, so that's good. So it's not like I'm, um, what's the expression? I'm not carrying owls to Athens, so I'm actually telling many of you something new. And I think this will be um, interesting because I think it's a um, sort of test ca case or an example for the way knowledge might be represented more generally. So I will explain the study as a starting point to then develop the research of the Potsdam Embodied Cognition Group. This is the, study, the uh, method that was used in the study by Dehane and colleagues. Uh, it's a very simple laboratory task. People look at a computer screen where random digits appear and each digit must be classified as odd or even. The participants are being told a rule before they start. So let's say if the rule is even numbers right, then now you would press the right button. You do this for several minutes and then the rule is changed and then for the rest of the experiment you would use the opposite button for the even numbers. So then you would press the left button when you see number eight or two or four. Okay, so at the end of this experiment, you would have, as an experimenter, you would have from every participant and for every number, the average right-hand reaction time and the average left-hand reaction time. Everyone follows so far? Okay, so, and the surprising thing now is that these average reaction times are not the same. If you calculate the difference right minus left-hand reaction times, this kind of graphic tends to appear for every subject. This is a group average, but typically people show the same pattern on an individual level, namely smaller numbers are classified faster with the left hand and larger numbers are classified faster with the right hand. And this has become known as the spatial numerical association of response codes. That is the SNARK effect. That's the acronym, the SNARK. And the SNARK effect has been shown in many, many different tasks, not just um, um, dealing with the meaning of numbers, like the parity status or the magnitude, but also if you have to classify whether the name of the number um, consists or contains a particular vowel or not. So this kind of magnitude meaning is activated automatically and is automatically associated with space. It doesn't only occur in button press responses, but also affects eye movements, hand movements, head movements, all kinds of body movements. I'll give you examples later. So it's a very pervasive bias that is hard to explain. Why, why would that bias occur? Oh, and before I continue, um, I should say that these kind of data can be nicely summarized with a re regression analysis. So the best fitting linear equation gives you a slope. The steepness of that slope tells you the strength of the spatial mapping for a given person. And so later we will look at um, negative slope coefficients or sometimes positive ones. Okay, now part two, or actually the, the, the first part of my research, which is to document sensory and motor biases when we deal with number concepts. And the purpose of this is to convince you that numbers are um, embodied representations. So the important picture in this uh, diagram of the display events in, in the task is the bottom picture here. This shows you the task. The task is to press a button when you see a target which randomly appears in the right or left placeholder box. So it's a central button press and the location of the target is unpredictable. The things that happened before are task irrelevant. So this you will have recognized as the Posner detection task, very famous. And um, here we have replaced the central arrow with task irrelevant digits, small or large digits. Here's the digit nine which is on the screen for a while and then disappears and we are now measuring how fast people detect the target and the idea is if you can detect the target faster this means somehow your attention must have been shifted to that place where the target is. If you take more time then attention must have been somewhere else. Okay and the um, at the time surprising result was that when people had seen a low digit, a one or a two, then their um, detection speed was faster in the left visual field. And when people had seen a large digit, their detection speed was faster in the right visual field. Okay, so this is um, using, or this, this particular study was using a very well established method to assess your sensory abilities and the result is that there are systematic sensory biases after 
having seen a number. Your, your ability to pick up information is systematically biased in um, congruency with this snark effect. What about motor biases? Is the motor system, your behavior, somehow influenced from having thought about a number? The answer is yes, and this was shown in the parity task that you already know, but um, in this case, it's a touchscreen version of the parity task. So in order to trigger the number, people have to press their hand on the display in the center, and then they have to um, classify the, the number as odd or even, with a pre-arranged rule, by moving from the start to either the left or to the right target button. So in this case, the uh, movement uh, amplitudes are the same for left and right movements. They are e equally distant from the target, uh, from the start. And also the aiming requirements are the same. So this target on the right is the same size as the target on the left. And we would not expect any systematic changes in the movement times as a function of the um, magnitude of the number. So we are interested in particular now at the time it takes to move the finger up from the start and when do you touch down on the left or right target, the movement time, not the reaction time. And these movement times, they also show a snark-like effect. Namely, you are pointing faster to the left when you are thinking about a small number and you are pointing faster to the right when you are thinking about a large number. And like the previous study, this one also has been replicated and extended by other people. And together, these um, and other studies show, in my opinion, that number knowledge does have a sensory motor component as proposed by embodied cognition views. Okay, so that's part one done. And now I want to move on and introduce to you a particular view, not very um, broadly believed, but just my particular view and proposal about how we can think about knowledge representations in general. And then I want to illustrate this um, with examples from the numerical domain in particular. And I, I started out noticing that these different terms are very arbitrarily used in the literature. Some people talk about grounded cognition, Barsalou, for example. Uh, others use the label embodied cognition, and then there's also situated cognition, there's externalized con uh, cognition, etc., etc. So what I'm going to propose is that the most basic constraint on human cognition should be called grounded, the groundedness um, constraint which reflects the um, physical structure of the world, the experience of gravity, the fact that two objects cannot occupy the same place at the same time, the fact that light sources tend to be above us, these are um, universal constraints that we all experience. They are culture independent. On top of this, we each of us have individual specific sensory motor experiences and these should be labeled embodied because they are shaping our knowledge through our bodily experiences. And finally, there is a level of knowledge representation that should be called situated because we can um, adjust rapidly to particular task constraints that will uh, modify the otherwise present um, embodiment signatures or groundedness signatures in cognition, in our performance. And I will illustrate this now to, to um, try and convince you of this proposal. Okay, numerical grounding refers to the structure of the world. It's an evolutionary constraint that has shaped our nervous system and in the domain of numerosities or magnitudes, you can experience this whenever you have more of something, the pile will grow, it will be, it will be taller. And this is why large magnitudes are actually associated with the upward position, whereas small magnitudes are associated with downward. So we are now talking about the vertical dimension of spatial numerical associations, not the horizontal. And indeed, when you think about it, the horizontal dimension was just um, discovered first because it's very convenient, because our keyboards are lying flat, flat on the table and we have a left key and a right key. But it turns out that um, there's also a vertical association that was discovered a bit later, both with eye movements and with hand movements. And it reflects um, this physical necessity that piles grow when they, um, when they reflect larger <laughs> numerosities. Numerical embodiment refers to our sensory motor experiences. So it's contingent upon one's learning and one's activities. 
Different people have different bodies, small or tall, old or young. All these things will influence the way you, um, your knowledge will be available to you. And an example of this is shown in this particular uh, schematic here. It shows you another version of the parity task. This study was done by uh, Michael Andres and colleagues. The task is to adopt an intermediate hand opening, like this one, and then the, the numbers are presented to the participant, and they have to change their grasp either to a closure or to an opening in order to respond with an odd or even judgment. Okay? And again, you can do this in two different ways. So the rules are changed for every person half the way through the experiment. And the um, response latencies were measured with um, electrodes. So you can measure how quickly the grasp changes just by measuring um, um, muscle potentials. And what was found is that people can close their hand faster when they respond to small numbers. And they open their hand faster when they respond to large numbers. And this is, I think, a good illustration of how our interaction with objects of different sizes and different magnitudes shapes the way we think about these number symbols. So if I have a big object like an apple, I will use a power grip. And if I have a small object like a um, peanut, I will use a precision grip. Okay, last but not least, um, we also think there is a need to postulate a third level, which is situation-specific knowledge representations, because, as I will show you, the um, spatial numerical association can rapidly change. It's not the case that this is a very persistent mapping between numbers and space, at least for the horizontal dimension. It can rapidly change. Um, an illustration of this comes from um, the work of Tobias Lötcher. He asked participants to close their eyes and then turn their head in pace with a metronome from left to right. So they would have to turn their head like this. And, and at every turning point, they would have to generate a random number between 1 and 30. Okay, so they would go 8, 14, 27, 1, 9. It had, and it was supposed to be random, and it took, I think, two minutes or so. And what you can see here is the number of small numbers generated for right turns and left turns in two different conditions. The important point is that people generate on average more smaller numbers when their head is turned to the left and they generate on average more large numbers when their head is turned to the right. So this shows that your current posture also influences the availability of certain knowledge representations and that's not uh, just true for numbers, it's also true in other domains. Um, some of you might know this interesting study. When you lean back, you can remember much more details about your last dental appointment. <laughs> and yeah. Uh, okay, so anyway, this, this is an example of these situation specific influences of your body configuration on the availability of knowledge. So to summarize, part two number knowledge reflects sensory motor contributions from different time scales, from this long evolutionary time scale to intermediate sensory motor experiences that you've had over the course of your life, and um, the more recent ones are the more important ones, and situational current task constraints. Okay, so that's part two, and now in part three, I want to talk about implications that this kind of um, hierarchical view of knowledge representations from an embodiment perspective might have for our understanding of number knowledge. So I'm going to show you research that was done by my group um, in these three different um, in, on, on these three different levels, starting with a study that describes um, the grounding or an, a prediction coming from this groundedness postulate, namely that the vertical snark effect should be quite robust. This will then be contrasted with the um, situatedness level. Horizontal snark is very flexible. It will change from one second to the next. And then I will spend the most time on the most recent developments. This is the work of the Potsdam Embodied Cognition Group. Namely, um, we are studying finger counting habits. And this, these are sensory motor experiences. Most people have acquired number knowledge through finger counting. And um, the surprising finding is that even in adults, these um, behavioral signatures of finger counting still influence the way they think about numbers in very simple tasks. Okay, grounding. So 
As I already told you, um, I think the finding of the snark effect along the horizontal dimension was a bit of a coincidence. Um, initially, people thought this is, um, this is um, the result of long-standing culturally transmitted habits, for example, reading or writing. Um, and to um, test this, we started to compare three different groups of subjects. So the Canadians, like probably most of us here, read and write from left to right. And that's true for numbers and um, text. Palestinians read and write text and numbers from right to left. But Israelis, they read text, Hebrew text from right to left, but numbers are read and written from left to right. So, and all these different people did the parity task, and the results here are showing you the, um, the um, best fitting linear regression for the results, and you can see the typical snark effect on your left for the Canadian group, small numbers associated with the left side, the Palestinians show the clear opposite of that. They associate small numbers with the right. And um, Israelis do not show a spatial mapping. And that's true both on the group level and also on the individual level. And um, suggests that there may indeed be two different scanning or, or um, writing habits that are in conflict, these two directions. And they might cancel each other and prevent spatial numerical mappings. That's what we initially thought. but. Then we um, did a test, and the crucial test, so together with Sam Shaki, who um, lives and works in Israel, the crucial test was to now allow Israeli participants to respond to these numbers with vertically arranged keys, rather than horizontally arranged keys. So we basically removed the um, conflict and allowed the responses to be in, in an orthogonal dimension, orthogonal to the reading habits. And when we did this, we found in the same people, these are now the um, um, Israeli participants only, we found they do not show a spatial, uh, significant spatial mapping along the horizontal dim dimension. This is the dashed line. It's not statistically different from zero. But they do show, at the same time, um, significant spatial mapping for the vertical, with small numbers being associated with the bottom and large numbers with the top. So even, even these, um, this cultural group does prefer to map numbers or associate numbers with space when possible. And um, that's the first indication that the vertical snark is the more profound one. Another one comes from this study, which takes two real-life spatial numerical mappings that all of you will encounter every day. The one in the red frame is on your mobile phones, small numbers at the top. And the one in the green frame is the one on the numerical keyboards on the right side. There is a um, num number keypad. And here the small numbers are at the bottom. So the green frame is the one that is consistent with this groundedness assumption that uh, I mentioned earlier to you. The red one is, is in conflict. Nevertheless, when you ask people to, uh, to classify numbers as odd or even with vertically arranged keys, some show, some show this... Um, um, unusual mapping, let's, let's call it the um, smartphone mapping here, with a positive slope. So they associate small numbers with the top. And then the majority of people, the other group here, associate small numbers with the bottom. And now what we did is we asked people in each of these groups to perform a data entry task that was in conflict with their initially occurring preference. So, for example, the people who were in the red group, the group with the red circle around it, they would be asked to sit down in front of a, a computer, and they would press the space bar, and whenever they press the space bar, a three-digit number appears on a computer screen, and they would have to tap it out on an imaginary keypad. There's no, no stimulus on the blank table, but they have to remember that this keypad looks like the one shown down here. So the people in the red group have to imagine entering data on the green keypad. And similarly, all the people in the green group were told to do a data entry task using this imaginary red keypad. Okay? And they did this for several minutes, let's say um, 
20 minutes or so, and then they were tested during the experiment, and then they did a bit more of the same data entry, and then they were tested again, and they were also tested on the next day with this vertical SNARK parity task. And the question was whether the um, grounded mapping, the one that we think is the more ecologically valid one, is more persistent than the red one, which should be ephemeral and just reflect recent habits. Okay, so how quickly can we untrain the vertical snark? And the answer is not as clear as I had wished, but it still shows you the main point, namely that the grounded mapping is very persistent, it cannot be reversed, and the, um, re and the red mapping, the one that's sort of inconsistent with this groundedness assumption, can at least be abolished, but it takes some time. But it can also not be reversed in this study. And I did another one that also didn't reverse it. So there's more, more um, to it than just um, a bit of data entry. Interestingly, a side effect, if you have another person sitting next to the person doing the data entry and their job is just to check what this person is doing, so they have to detect a target sequence and, and re remember how often a particular target number would be entered, even though there is nothing on the table. So these passive viewing participants, they show the same kind of uh, pattern here. So they also learn and unlearn from observing the active person doing a data entry. And that's interesting because um, it tells you something about the origin of spatial numerical mappings. It is sufficient to observe spatial behaviors of others in a numerical context for you to change your own mapping. Okay, so that was some indication of a very slowly changing spatial numerical mapping, and now I want to talk about the opposite, a very rapidly changing mapping, and this was tested with Russian Hebrew bilinguals, so you'll be able to read more from the coming display than I will, because um, we showed people um, alternating number words and digits. A number word, digit, number word, digit, and so people could just continue to categorize these uh, with two horizontal buttons as odd or even, and the important manipulation here was that the number words were randomly written in the Hebrew or the Cyrillic script. The Hebrew script, remember, has to be read from right to left, the Cyrillic from left to right. If you look at the, at the display, you can see what it looked like on the screen. Number word, auto even, number, auto even, number word, auto even, number, auto even, and so forth and so forth. And here are the data for the number words. Uh, remember, a negative slope is the typical Western pattern. And we can see that the number words, when they were written in the Cyrillic script, they were mapped according to the typical snark effect, so that small numbers were associated with uh, left and large numbers with right. But the Hebrew number words already show an absence of a snark effect. Okay, but these are now the same people classifying different stimuli. What happens when the same people classify the same stimuli, namely the digits that were presented immediately after a um, letter string, after a number word? And here we find actually a very similar pattern. Again, the, um, the people who had just seen, I mean, this, this is the same people. So when the person had just seen a Russian word, then the digit would immediately be mapped onto the left small, right, large mapping, but if the preceding number word was in Hebrew, then the digit would no longer induce this kind of spatial mapping. It's significantly reduced, at least. So you can see that within the same person, for the same stimuli, within just a second or so, the nature of the, um, of the spatial numerical mapping is changed. And this is indicating to us that the um, the um, horizontal mapping is very flexible. And last but not least, I want to give some examples about, um, about um, the embodied level of spatial number mappings. And to do this, I need some audience participation. So if you just stop typing and take down all the things you hold in your hand, and then you just um, count on your fingers from 1 to 10. Okay? Use your fingers to count from 1 to 10. And now, please, by, sh by showing your hand, how many of you started on the right hand? Okay, roughly half. On the left hand? Okay, also roughly half. Interesting. Let's keep that in mind. 
Um, there is a questionnaire on the internet. If you want to generate some more data, we can uh, still collect data on this. The questionnaire is really just this picture here and a pull-down menu next to it. It's being done in many different languages, as you can see. And we are interested in the um, distribution. So it turns out these are some data from t uh, 2011. So it turns out there is a geographical gradient so that English-speaking countries like the US, UK, Canada, they have a clear preference to start counting on the left hand. And then as you move more eastwards through Europe, this um, seems to reduce 50-50 in Italy and Belgium. And then uh, Iran, which um, um, contributed several hundred people because of our colleague from, uh, from the University of Tehran, Ahmad Alipur. Um, for them, uh, the preference is clearly reversed. They like to start counting on the right. Well, they also write from right to left, and also they have cultural taboos that prevent them from using their left hand. Okay, that's um, just the descriptive data, and now we want to know, does the finger counting habit influence the way adults think about numbers? So we invited left starters and right starters into the lab, and they did the... Um, parity task and what we are looking at here is a frequency distribution or, or percentage probability distribution if you want of the different regression slopes so the typical regression slope if you remember is between 0 and 20 milliseconds per digit this is uh, minus uh, so it's a negative slope that's the typical pattern and we found this um, in the majority of left starters, these are the light gray bars. Most of them have the typical snark effect, but there are also some exceptions, some people with a reverse snark effect. More importantly, the people who start counting on their right hand, for them, the snark effect is significantly diluted. So the, the whole distribution is shifted to the right. Many more people who have positive slopes, and also more extreme cases, as you can see. So um, def definitely indication that finger counting habits uh, influence the way people think about numbers. A more impressive demonstration comes from the study by my colleague Frank Domas. Um, he compared across two different cultures. So the um, Chinese are capable of counting on one hand up to ten, whereas in most Western cultures um, we use the hand to count from one to five and then switch hands. Um, and the data that you see in the bottom graph here, they show you three different things. The first thing they show is that the Chinese, when they do a parity, uh, sorry, they do a magnitude classification. I should explain the task first. So the task is you see two digits on the screen, and you just have to press a button on the side of the larger digit. So all dealing with symbolic numbers. No finger counting involved. And these are adults. And you see the red curve is below the blue curve, so the Chinese are generally faster at um, performing these magnitude classifications for digital symbols uh, compared to the Germans. A uh, second interesting thing is that as the numbers get bigger, I'm sure no one can read this, so on the far left here, these numbers are the pairs 1, 3, 2, 4, 3, 5. These are the easiest to classify, and here on the right, you have double-digit pairs, um, 17, 19, or 18, 20. So as the numbers get bigger, people are slower in deciding which is the bigger number. That's also not such a surprising finding. It also explains, by the way, the reason there is such a dip here, both for the Chinese and for the Germans, because that's the point where um, a single digit and a double digit are both visible on the screen. So it's very easy to decide which of the two is the bigger one. Okay, the more important thing from the perspective of embodied cognition is the fact that there are systematic penalties. So the systematic penalty for Germans occurs when the numbers exceed, um, exceed five. So here you have the pair four, six. This is the first time there is an increase in the time to classify that goes beyond what you would normally expect from the size alone, from the magnitude alone. And Presumably, this is also the first time that the two numbers cannot be represented by two hands, because you have the four, which requires you to use one hand, this way, or this way, depending on how, and number six, 
you have one other hand, but this is only giving you five. So you need a third hand, but you don't have it. And that, that sounds a bit strange. It's a, it sounds like a peculiar explanation, but it is nicely confirmed or corroborated by the fact that the very same penalty occurs when the Chinese, for the first time, have to deal with numbers that are exceeding their finger counting range. So now, when they have to deal with numbers bigger than 10, they also are looking for their third hand and can't find it. And that's when they are slower. So that's, I think, a very nice study. And some other studies are published now, and they all converge on this idea that finger counting, finger counting is um, effective for numerical cognition in, in adults. We also recently um, worked in collaboration with um, Friedemann Pulvermüller's lab to investigate the brain areas that are active when people passively view numbers or number words. Um, and we split our participants into two groups, those who start on the left and those who start counting on the right. And then they were put into an MRI scanner and they would do two tasks. So one task is the so-called localizer task. Um, let's say when you are a right starter and you make these movements with your right hand, this will activate your left motor cortex. And this is how we localize the, the, place, where, the place in the brain that moves your fingers. And then in a second condition, people were passively viewing small numbers from one to five. And here are the results. And the results show you that in these two tasks, the active finger movement and the passive number viewing um, there's an overlap of brain areas. So for the left starters, the red circles or the red areas indicate the right motor cortex that moves the fingers of the left hand. And you can see that it overlaps partially with some green areas that show activation that is specific for the observation, the passive viewing of small numbers. And that shows that there is um, indeed some um, physiological realism to this proposed network that I showed you at the beginning, the distributed network um, of knowledge that involves sensory or, in this case, motor cortices as, as part of the, the neural representation of knowledge. Okay, so the last few minutes I want to um, show you how we are now moving on to advanced embodiment theory. We are using as our starting point a very well established model of number processing that was proposed by Dehane, who is also the discoverer of the SNARK effect. And it's called the triple code model. You see here these three different blobs. They represent different um, representations of um, number knowledge. One is called visual Arabic. This is um, active when you see Arabic symbols or write them. Another one is um, active when you speak numbers or number words or comprehend them. And the third, um, abbreviated as MNL, is the mental number line. This is the actual magnitude representation, the, the knowledge of what a number really means. And um, so you see there are already some modalities that are being considered when we think about number knowledge. So you have the auditory, you have the visual, but there is no haptic or tactile dimension in this model yet. And we want to use, in the Peacock group, the Potsdam Embodied Cognition group, we want to use the finger activity as an independent variable to establish the causality of finger knowledge um, in our activation of number concepts. And in particular, we're interested in the time course of activation. So we want to know, do finger movements facilitate or interfere with numerical cognition? One method that we're using is depicted here. It consists of uh, braille stimulators that are normally used for uh, the blind. So each of your fingers can go onto one of those discs. This is for the right hand. So you can put your pinky here, ring finger, middle finger, index finger, and then the thumb on the side. And we have another one for the left hand, of course. And then you can vibrate these different pins and you can see a schematic of the vibration pattern and um, one way of using this nice tool is to investigate the tactile sensitivity. So, for example, in the D3, which is the um, middle finger, there is a slightly larger amplitude, um, amplitude modulation, and that's the target which has to be detected among all the um, noisy distractors. That's, that's an example of um, task, and what we are doing is we are interested in a bit more higher level processes, so we are asking people to put their two hands on these two tactile stimulators, 
and we present them with two stimuli at the same time. So, for example, we would um, have a, a tactile pattern that is stimulating the thumb, index, and middle finger, either successively or simultaneously. In both cases, this is consistent with the finger counting habit of the person, if they count with their three fingers, one, two, three. Or we can stimulate some other fingers that are not um, used for the counting, for example, the um, pinky, the middle finger, and the thumb. These are also three fingers being stimulated, but they are not used in that way for counting. Okay, that's the one modality, the tactile modality, and then simultaneously we can present either a visual stimulus, which is also a number, or we can, um, I don't, you can't see it here, but the person is wearing headphones, we can present auditory numbers. In all these different setups, we are always interested in whether there is a congruency benefit, whether the um, um, stimulation with a visual number and a tactile number leads to a faster recognition of the, um, of the number in either modality. Okay, so for example, um, my, colleague, my colleagues have already um, shown a semantic distance effect. So when the numerical distance between the number in one modality and the number in the other modality is large, then it takes longer to find out which of those is the larger number. People have to pay attention to both modalities. And um, as the numerical difference increases, it becomes easier for them to make that decision. And that's consistent with what we know from the unimodal processing of numbers. Okay, so here's uh, something that's currently in progress. This is Elena Sixtus, who is doing her PhD research. She is asking participants to adopt canonical or non-canonical counting postures. So this is a non-canonical number three. But in other conditions, you can also put the three fingers for counting on the table. And as at the same time, they are trying to um, classify a number that is auditorily or visually presented. And we are recording their latencies with a voice key. And what we have already found is that there is a congruency benefit. And this is shown in the green bars. So the green bars are the congruent conditions when the tactile modality is congruent with the other one, which can be visual or um, auditory, I think, I actually don't remember which modality it was in this case, but the important point is that the benefit only exists when the hand is adopting canonical postures, the ones that are actually used for counting. It does not happen when some other group of fingers is being used. Um, finally, I think this is my last um, methods report from Peacock. Um, we are using transcranial magnetic stimulation because as I've showed you earlier, the finger motor cortex is apparently involved in number processing and it's also easy to localize. So all we have to do is fi find uh, the place on the primary motor cortex that when we stimulate it with um, TMS makes the fingers twitch. This place will then be stimulated um, um, either on the left or on the right motor cortex. The participants are either left or right starters. They do the questionnaire I showed you. And before they do the main experiment, we are not just localizing their primary motor hand motor cortex, but we are also estimating the time it takes them to be 75% correct in the identification of visually presented numbers, very briefly presented digits that are masked. So by adjusting the duration of the digit, we can find out how long the digit should be presented for each individual so that this person roughly recognizes three out of four of those numbers. And um, then they do the main experiment, which involves stimulating the um, motor cortex of the hand while the um, numbers are being presented. And the results that we have here are a bit preliminary. They, they are from, last, uh, from late last year and not published yet. But uh, what you are looking at is the probability of correctly identifying the numbers. We are looking at small numbers, smaller than five, and larger numbers, larger than five. And of course, our prediction is for the small numbers, the ones that you use the um, hand um, to start counting. And um, what we are looking at is also the congruent stimulation. So congruent here means the um, motor cortex is being stimulated for the side that is um, usually used to control the hand for the beginning to start counting. So that means Specifically in this particular condition here, congruent smaller, you can see that the TMS pulse that is delivered 200 milliseconds after the um, digit presentation 
selectively interferes with the presentation, uh, with the visual perception of um, small numbers. So I think that's actually something I have to repeat because it's pretty impressive when you really think about it. We are stimulating primary motor cortex and this reduces the ability to see numbers, not all the numbers, just the ones that would be counted on those fingers of that hand where we are stimulating the motor cortex. Okay. Summary for part three. Number knowledge reflects sensory motor components at different time scales with different weights. So the idea here is that um, the spatial numerical association, which I'm using as some sort of a signature for the embodiment of uh, number knowledge, is a weighted uh, combination of grounded, embodied, and situated um, knowledge representations that are all contributing to the final bias in your spatial performance and um, we think that probably the weight that is associated or assigned to the spatial, uh, sorry, to the um, situated level of knowledge representation is the biggest. So this will be the most influential constraint. Does this have any practical implications? Some of you may wonder, okay, this is my little niche of the world, but why would you care? I think you should care because um, it does have practical implications and they were shown in a very influential paper in science. Um, when people are being uh, shown two different tasks, one of them is the um, task of adding or subtracting and the other task is to make eye movements to the left or to the right. Two independent tasks. Each of them activates certain brain areas. Then uh, Knops and colleagues um, found that these two different tasks um, utilize partially overlapping brain areas in the parietal cortices. So they found that rightward saccades, rightward eye movements, use some brain areas that are also active during addition, and leftward brain areas, are, uh, left, leftward eye movements, use brain areas that are active during subtraction. So what we see here is one of the earliest um, examples that generalizes the snark effect to real-life arithmetic behavior. It's one of the earliest from 2009. Um, an even earlier one comes from my lab, um, Pinas and Fischer. We used my good old touch screen and asked people to touch a start point on the computer screen to trigger the display of an arithmetic problem that could be either an addition or a subtraction. The task was to point to that place on this number line that corresponds to the result. And you can see, for example, that the problem 6 minus 4 gives you 2. And then you point to where you think the number 2 would be, roughly there, very quickly. And we measure speed and accuracy of these pointing movements. Interestingly, any of those target pointing, uh, any of the points that you are targeting can be the result of an addition or a subtraction. So here the result 2 is um, the result of a subtraction, but you can also add 1 plus 1, you also have to point to 2. And that's what we were comparing, and you can see here that the target results, as indicated by the horizontal landing coordinate on the screen, so leftmost part of the screen, to the rightmost part of the screen, that's our dependent measure. And we can see that these um, landing positions systematically differ depending on whether the target is the result of an addition or a subtraction. So for example, the result 4, when it's computed as um, 6 minus 2, then you point slightly more left, and if it's um, 2 plus 2, then you point slightly more to the right. And that's true for all the numbers. And this is now called the operational momentum effect. The idea that we are somehow moving along a mental number line toward the bigger numbers, which are usually on the right, and thereby induce some bias. And we are traveling along to the left, to the smaller numbers when we subtract. And that, that has um, practical implications because we can now use um, current technology such as uh, tablets, PC tablets, in order to train even young children who are very capable of dealing with tablets, we can train them in the acquisition of number concepts by monitoring or inducing left and right what pointing movements in a, in a gaming context, in a games environment. Um, there is a caveat here, that's probably the last thing I need to say before I finish, and the caveat is that there are already a lot of uh, training software, a lot of applications available. I'm sure you've seen some of them. 
and they all fail to recognize that the use of such tablets changes cognition fundamentally. They don't think about this, they just go ahead and program some sort of game, maybe with numbers, maybe with other things, not realizing that cognition changes fundamentally when you use tablets as opposed to computer screens, remote screens like, like um, yeah, there's none here. So the ones that are physically separated from you, they are delivering information in a very different way compared to those that you are in physical contact with. This is something that embodied cognition researchers are very aware of. So this is um, what we are studying and this is the last thing I wanted to say before I like to thank you for your attention. Hi, um, so a question about the definition of um, grounding versus embodiment in relation to the linear equation that you had. Um, so for one, I was wondering how exactly do you define it? How do you decide? You said evolutionary versus experience, mm. but it seems to me that sometimes you get overlap or rather that grounding sort of you know, embraces mm. the embodiment. And I was A, wondering how you is it a part in your definition? B, what would you predict? Like it seems to me that grounding should then be more fundamental, but you could also manipulate grounding in your findings, right? So you, you could sort of train people to actually show the opposite pattern or at mm. least you know, go away from their original pattern. And C, I was wondering how does it affect the linear equation if one is embedded within the other? Mm. Long question, sorry. Yes, very good questions. And um, I have more pragmatic than um, deep philosophical answers. So I agree with you, there is a continuum. It's not like three different classes of knowledge representations because ultimately we also must experience um, the physical constraints of the world and we experience them through our sensory and motor activities so it's harder to lift the arm than to drop the arm because of gravity so in the embodiment level there's always the gravity part that, that I have assigned to the groundedness. I think it's a pragmatic solution to say there are different manipulations and they will have different learning or unlearning gradients so if you change the mapping um, the prediction is, and, and I showed you examples, that the vertical mapping should be much slower to modify than the horizontal one. And um, also I think the difficulty of, of doing those manipulations indicates whether you are dealing with a simple sensory motor or with a sort of more fundamental aspect because v uh, vertical mappings um, if you want to manipulate them, you might have to resort to virtual reality scenarios, whereas horizontal mappings, they are very convenient and they exist anywhere. There are a lot of examples in the world. So it's not a principled distinction in the sense that you can be sure at the end it's grounded or embodied, but it's a pragmatic distinction that points to the um, differential learnability. Hey, really great talk. You know, I'm, I'm a big embodied cognition fan in general. I guess I, I've got a, a quick question, and this is actually, I apologize, kind of an obnoxious question. But, you know, most of your effects here seem to really imply that people are learning and that they learn and that learning is constrained by both the body and, both, and by the environment, right? And I think that's, that would uh, sum up, you know, a, a large number of, of the effects that you presented. Mm -hmm. And so recognizing that fact, uh, what's useful about calling this all embodied cognition? Or I guess another way to ask the question would be, uh, what are you arguing against? Mm. Good. Yeah, that's, uh, that's putting it to the point. What am I arguing against? I'm arguing against the notion that the knowledge that we are tapping into is independent of sensory and motor features. So the empirical evidence that I've showed was always showing interactions with particular motor tasks or uh, in the earlier part with this sen the, the sensory manipulation. So I think these are ways of um, 
arguing against the traditional view that I introduced in the beginning. And the rest of my ambition is very limited. It's just to try and pinpoint the mechanism, for example, with the time course analysis that comes out of the TMS um, experiments. So we are basically titrating now the time course to better understand how the different modalities integrate into one um, number concept. Uh, thank you for an extremely interesting talk, and uh, the question is the following. Uh, there is uh, probably at least uh, one more form of knowledge that is also mapped onto space and probably embodied, it is time. Mm -hmm. And uh, is there a sort of snark effect with uh, time perception when you react to earlier and later hours with your left and right hand? And mm -hmm. if so, uh, is it somehow crossed uh, with uh, numerical cognition or just embodied as well? Uh, for example, uh, if we uh, take working hours and ask our subject to classify earlier hours with the left hand and later hours with the right hand, uh, having like things like eight and nine to the left hand and uh, three or four to the mm -hmm. right hand, will they interfere somehow or will they mm -hmm. work jointly? What would be your prediction? Um, I don't have to make predictions because that study was done by um, a colleague called Peter Brugger. In 1998, he published a study in Neuropsychologia where they instructed people to think of the numbers that they were classifying as either lengths on a ruler, which um, have small numbers left, large numbers right, or the same numbers were thought of as times on a clock face. And as you have correctly observed, on a clock face, the big numbers are actually on the left. And in this study, um, in correspondence with maybe your expectations, the spatial mapping was reversed under the clock imagery instruction compared to the ruler imagery instruction. So it's, it's another an instance of this very flexible horizontal mapping. And time, time more general, to answer the first part of your question, has been... Um, uh, that, that's no, no. Let, let me answer this, and then you can judge from my answer whether what, what you take from it. So, the, there is research on the um, spatial mapping of time, a timeline. Most of us see the future in front of us, the past behind us. Uh, there are some cultures with the reverse. Um, uh, Lera Boroditsky has done some work in Chinese, I think, um, where there is a vertical timeline, so there's a cultural dependence of how time is mapped onto space because we cannot map, uh, we, we cannot experience time directly. We have to use some sort of a substitute to infer time from it. And that is also um, consistent with the fact that you can bias the perception of time through spatial manipulations, but you cannot manipulate the perception of space by temporal manipulations. It's a bit, um, sounds a bit um, mysterious, but I don't have time to explain this, we, we can talk later what, what has been done, but time is certainly the weaker dimension compared to space. But um, the last point I want to make is that much of the research about spatial numerical association is motivated by a theoretical proposal by Vincent Walsh, which was published in TICS in Trends in Cognitive, Neuros uh, Trends in Cognitive Science 2003, and has been known as the ATOM, A Theory of Magnitude, where he postulates that the dimensions of time, space, and number are co-represented in the parietal lobes. And so there is some neurophysiological substrate for all these different magnitudes, be they spatial magnitudes, temporal magnitudes, or numerical magnitudes. And this research is sort of a driving factor behind much of the work that I did and some other people have done. I think, I think most of us are asking you somehow the same question, which is um, what, does it, what can it mean mechanistically, neurocomputationally, to say that something is, is embodied? Um, what, what's the, I mean, what you just said about the magnitude and so on and so forth is part of an answer to that. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I look at, you know, when I read Friedemann, Pulvermuller, um, I'm not quite sure what he says about abstract concepts, but if he's talking about an apple, um, I think, Fried you can correct me if I'm wrong, Yuri, but um, I think Friedman 
the mental representation of an apple is just the sensory experience of the colour and the taste and the uh, etc cetera, etc. Cetera. There's that that's all there is. There isn't something more um, than things that wire to, fire together, wire together, and that's it. Um, mm. But for for number. I don't think one can really, it can't just be how you count on your fingers, etc., etc., etc. But you, 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 in a sense, I mean, what you, you've, been, you've been describing ways in which all these bodily dimensions and external world dimensions relate to how one performs number related calculations, but you, you, you're, you're not really committing yourself to what they're all contributing to. I mean, mm -hmm. is, is it more than the sum of its parts? That's yes. the. Yeah, that's, that's a good way of summarizing what I'm also trying to answer. So as I said, we are still trying to work out the mechanism, for example, the time course with which these different modalities are being integrated. But I don't agree with the first thing you said. So it's not just the sum of the different fe sensory features, but also motor features like the pronunciation or the experience of biting into an apple that make the concept of an apple. So it's, it's richer than you or maybe a lot of other people in the past have thought and it engages sensory and motor processes to think of an apple. Um, my question is about the cutoff point between small and large numbers. In the original study, the uh, SNARK study, it was four, somewhere around four. And my question is, is it important that it's four? And if it is important, what are your ideas for, mm -hmm. for, for the reasons for that. Yes, yeah, so the original study, that was the Dehane and colleagues 1993, consists of nine different experiments. It's a very rich source. That's part of the reason why it has been cited so many times, because a lot of um, research got on its tracks in that original study, like culture comparison, etc. But um, uh, your question is about the, the um, meaning of small and large and it's a context dependent meaning it's a situated meaning and that was nicely shown in one of those early experiments where uh, the participants were either asked to classify by parity the numbers from 1 to 6 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 or the numbers from 4 to 9 so the number range was different and depending on whether the um, number 5 was the, the, among the large numbers or it was among the small numbers, it was associated with the right hand response or with the left hand response. So it's very context specific. The, the mapping depends on what is the current set of possible stimuli. And, and so I think this taps into the situated aspect of knowledge representation that you can um, expect certain numbers. To Hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. This is maybe an experiment that should still be done. All I can tell you is that when we ask people to, you know, blindfoldedly show where they think a number is, and they don't know ahead of time what the number will be, it can be any number, and then they have to show by pointing blindfolded. Here's number one. Here's number twenty-seven. Here's number three. Here's number four hundred ninety-nine. People spontaneously arrange the space around them either in a frontal parallel plane or radial outward or vertical. That's something they spontaneously do. And if then they are doing this for a while, they have established a range. And if you then go beyond it, they will probably have to stand up or walk somewhere. We've, we've done the first part. So we've, we've tried to map this out, and I, I published a paper on this, which I'll be happy to send. But we don't know what happens when you go suddenly far beyond this. The only study that has used verbal labels like gazillion or um, yeah, these, these crazy words for, for non-existent numbers um, was done by uh, Lance Rips, who is um, one of these uh, people who originally developed the uh, semantic networks. So he's still around, and last year he published a paper um, where he tried to understand how people think of such crazy numbers like gazillion, and he asked them to point on a number line. Okay, here is a, a, a jillion, where is a gazillion? And then they would have. <laughs> so he found he found that in this case the people are um, coming up with meaningful patterns. 
His question at the time was, is it a linear or a logarithmically compressed mapping? The data are a bit mixed and um, there are some methodological problems with this study. That's why I think this is a good question to investigate further. Yeah, actually, coming back to the third part of my previous question. Um, did, I, did I forget something? Yeah, but that's okay. It was a long question. Um, so, given that you're assuming that they're sort of your three predictors are couched one within the other, um, do you think you should move away from the linear regression model because the, mm. the errors aren't independent then mm. as far as I can see? And yes, I'm not wed to the uh, so linear that, equation, if okay. that's what you're asking. All right. yeah. Um, actually, it's a question from my neighbor. Uh, are there the, s the same studies uh, with alphabetic symbols? Mm -hmm. Yes, that, that was also part of the original set, actually. So one of those nine original studies compared, and instead of asking people to classify numbers as odd or even, um, they, people had to classify letters as consonants or vowels, and the letters came from the beginning or end of the alphabet. And in that case, in the original study, there were no systematic biases um, for the early letters to be associated with the left or the, le the letters from the end of the alphabet with the right. However, subsequently, it's always good to try and replicate these things. And so another study by uh, Wim Gevers, I think 2005 or so, showed both for letters of the alphabet and for months of the year and for letters of the week, pretty much any sequentially ordered continuum is mapped onto space because, um, well, that's my interpretation. I think the reason for all this is because space is um, um, a problem-solving aid which we like to use a lot. This is happening in children. We are now doing studies with children who are three or three and a half years old and we ask them to count objects. And so these children cannot read or write, but they already show counting preferences. They start on the left if they are in a um, left to right reading culture and they start counting these objects from right to left when they are in um, right to left reading or writing culture. And we think um, space is just a very easily available um, scaffolding mechanism or something like this that helps, uh, it, it's, it's supporting your learning and your concept acquisition. Mm. Yes, so again, um, the, qu the question with. Yes, okay. Um, the studies that I know, one of the nine famous studies by Dehane, is about left versus right handers, and in that case, there was no difference in the spatial numerical mapping for left handers or right handers. The reason. Um, I didn't mention this is because in my data from the left starters and right starters for counting, the proportion of left starters is the same among the left handers and the right handers. Your second question about the children, I do not know the answer. And, and different dominance patterns like footedness or eyedness, I also cannot answer yet. Hmm. I have a quick one. Um, so, very. Conveniently, when you do the TMS study uh, or, or if you do neuroimaging study, what you're looking for, of course, it came to the Mueller uh, networks. So you're looking for um, uh, sensory motor activation related to fingers because they're involved in a number, and that's, that's your embodied component. Um, given the theory, given the three componential theory of groundedness, embodiment, and situatedness, what would be your neural signature or anatomical, neural anatomical signature for groundedness? Hmm. Where will you be fishing for specific components implemented in the brain that you would call grounded? Hmm. That's a very good question for everyone to answer. <laughs> Do you have an answer for this? I have an idea. Yeah? I was thinking about that. I have an idea. Go ahead. So my idea would be you can, you can look for, you can actually search in light sensitivity domain because if the more is up, then you should be more sensitive to light because sun is up. So if you project upness to where source of uh, um, um, typical source of light comes from, then you should 
get more light sensitivity activation in the brain for large numbers than for small. That's the only thing I can think of because how else is the physical world represented neuroanatomically? Mm, I, I'm not sure I can follow you. So the reasoning here is that in any modality there is grounding, embodiment and situations because you can experience in any of your sensory modalities these constraints. And um, so... Yeah, but you show a distinct effect uh, in, in, in motor cortex related to fingers, right? Yes. To finger <laughs> movement. <laughs> If these are distinct effects, situated, grounded, or components mm -hmm. of representation, of your mm -hmm. number of representations, mm -hmm. situated, grounded, and embodied, then it would be natural to expect that something should light up in the brain uh, for the vertical snark, which is a grounded component. Mm -hmm. And the only thing I can think of, if there's displacement upwards, mm -hmm. then the only grounded thing that I can think of would be uh, the stronger sort of light stimulation from the uh, sun as the source. Something like that. Okay, I think I, I vaguely understand this, but there is a further complication, which is that at this point no one knows where the neural signature for SNARK is, because all imaging studies suffer from this shortcoming that they basically just discover response conflict. So we still need a nice method that removes the response conflict to localize a particular area and then see how it's modulated by these three different levels. So more to be done. <laughs> all right, um, on that bookshelf, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, tomorrow, what, what else is there? <laughs>